Hello, my name is Daniel Shagan. I am a first year GI fellow uh, at OSU. As most of you guys who have rotated with us know, we are primarily out of St. Francis and we work with the Warren Clinic GI group. Um, I'll be talking today or this afternoon or whatever time you're actually listening and watching this. We're we'll talking about lower GI bleeding. Uh, my co-fellow Larry Johnston uh, talked to you guys, I believe it was um, in the fall or maybe it was, it was later on, uh, it was late 2019 about um, upper GI bleeding. So I'll be covering kind of the counterpart of his talk here. So um, it's, it's got some pretty cool pictures and uh, I'm pretty excited about it. So I hope, hope you guys are too. Uh, just as kind of a background, uh, lower GI bleeding accounts for about 20 to 30 percent of all patients who present with GI bleeding in general. Um, the rest are, generally speaking, from either the mid gut or from the upper GI uh, tract. Um, it's got a pretty low annual incidence, 0.03 percent. Um, there is a 200 fold increase from the second to eighth uh, decades of life, and as we'll see, age is one of the primary risk factors. Uh, so as, as we get older, we have a higher risk for uh, lower GI bleeding. Uh, interestingly, 15% of all presumed lower GI bleeds are actually ultimately found to be from the upper GI tract. Um, Full-time GI doctors manage um, greater than 10 cases per year. And uh, for those of you who already have rotated with us, you know that we manage you know, 10 cases every three days. And those of you who haven't, you'll very quickly get familiar with how much um, Presumably, there are a lower GI tract uh, admissions to the hospital. Uh, it's got a general mortality rate of 2 to 4%. Um, so some definitions. Uh, historically, lower GI bleeding is defined as any bleeding that's distal to the ligament of trites. I said historically because with the advent of small bowel um, enteroscopy and you know, capsule endoscopy and different various ways to evaluate the small intestine, uh, we now call small bowel bleeding, which is also distal to the ligament of trites, we call that mid-gut bleeding. So the modern definition of lower GI bleeding, and really what this talk will encompass, refers to bleeding that's distal to the IC valve, essentially anything that originates from the colon or the rectum. And even more specifically, this talk will uh, encompass really acute GI bleed, acute lower GI bleeding, and that refers to bleeding that is less than three days in duration that may uh, may or does result in hemodynamic instability, anemia, or the need for transfusion of, of packed red blood cells. Um, furthermore, uh, as far as definitions, this is, might be kind of obvious here, but just for completion's sake, hematochesia, passing of uh, red blood per rectum, severe hematochesia, refers to continued bleeding uh, in the first 24 hours. Uh, drop a hemoglobin of greater than two grams and or patients requiring two or more units of packed red blood cells. Uh, melina, again, sounds kind of obvious, passing of black tarry stools. Uh, just a point that I, I like to make that we, uh, we always mention to all the, all the residents who are rotating with us. Uh, when you were describing melina stools, it's, it's, the correct term is melanic stools and not melanotic. I used the term melanotic all the way up until really my first week of fellowship. Uh, melanotic refers to melanin, which refers to, you know, the, the pigment of our skin. Um, so when we're talking about the type of stool that is considered melana, we're talking about melanic stools. Um, overt bleeding, when we have visible signs of uh, blood loss from the GI tract, so hematemesis, melana, hematochesia. Obscure bleeding is uh, when you have bleeding, but when it's not found on either upper or lower endoscopy or small bowel radiography. And then occult bleeding is exactly what it sounds like. Subacute bleeding, you can't clinically see it. And then some of the risk factors that um, may predict poor outcomes and lower GI bleeding. And let me let me be very clear. We don't have a lot of studies, at, at least compared to upper GI bleeding, to um, really predict you know poor outcomes when patients do have or have suspected lower GI bleeding. But some of some of the risk factors um, 
which you know are, are kind of obvious again uh, vital signs tachycardia hypotension and then syncope if you have ongoing gi bleeding uh, so gross blood on an on initial exam or if you have recurrent bleeding after it may initially resolve and it recurs um, anybody who have how, who has comorbid illnesses, age, history of known diverticulosis or angiectasias, which is why history is so important, renal failure or renal insufficiency on presentation, and then anemia. And the American College of Gastroenterology, which is one of the sources I used, um, they have a very, very good clinical uh, management guideline. They uh, consider initial hematocrit at presentation of less than 35% to be uh, anemia on presentation. And this is going to be where really the meat of this talk gets going here. So the, I just thought these, these charts here were, were kind of cool. The left one comes from the um, New England Journal. It basically lists the causes of the, the GI bleedings, uh, the, the different etiology of lower GI bleeding with the percentage of cases that it encompass it. On the right, it kind of breaks it up into um, different, different um, headings, if you will. So anatomic, vascular, inflammatory, and neoplastic. We'll be talking about most of these individually here. So just to kind of get going. Uh, oh, and this chart is really um, what, what I used as far as the most common etiologies. And this is from the American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopies guidelines on managing lower GI bleeding. So diverticular bleeding. So that's a couple pictures of a uh, bleeding diverticulum. You can see the fresh blood that's kind of oozing out there. So it's the most common cause of lower GI bleeding. Uh, diverticulosis are sac-like protrusions of the colonic wall. The prevalence of just diverticulosis, not necessarily uh, bleeding diverticulosis, but just the presence of it, increases with age uh, at least 60% by the age of 80. Or that, what that means is that by the age of 80, 60% of people have diverticulosis. Some of the more common risk factors um, that can increase the risk of diverticular bleed are NSAID use, hypertension, and any anticoagulation use. Um, the classically, uh, diverticular bleeding presents as painless hematochesia. The diagnosis in most cases is, a, is presumptive, which means that by history, um, by uh, known, you know, by known diverticular, by known presence of diverticulosis on prior endoscopy or on prior imaging. Um, a definitive diagnosis is made by colonoscopy about 22% of the time. So one in five times we can definitively diagnose a diverticular bleed. Um, and by definition, that means an active bleed, meaning you see blood coming out from the diverticulum, or presence of high-risk stigmata, which means oozing, a visible vessel, or uh, a clot that's adhered to where, that, where the bleed was, was happening. In terms of uh, diagnosis, uh, colonoscopy is better for left-sided diverticulosis. Uh, interestingly, 75% of diverticulosis um, is left-sided in Western countries. Angiography is better for diagnosing right-sided diverticulosis. And interestingly, right-sided diverticulosis is responsible for at least 50%, if not close to 100% of all diverticular bleeding. Treatment. Um, at least three quarters of diverticular bleeding spontaneously resolve without any therapy. Um, if, if you know, we do elect, and most of the time we do um, elect to uh, perform or at least attempt to perform treatment. Colonoscopy is able to localize the bleeding site in addition to performing um, therapy. Some of the examples are injection with epinephrine or cautery. We'll talk about some of the real specific causes or specific therapies, not just for diverticular bleeding, but for all causes of lower GI bleeding later on in the talk. Uh, Angiography, which is performed by interventional radiology, um, is um, angiography is used if you're not able to either identify the bleeding diverticulum or if you're not able to achieve hemostasis with colonoscopy. Uh, with angiography comes a little bit more in terms of uh, what 
what you can or what you should do depending on who you talk to or what, what interventional radiologist is, is helping you. Um, so tagged RBC scan to help localize. We'll talk about that later on. Um, if during a colonoscopy you're able to localize the bleeding but you're not able to stop the bleeding, you can place a hemostatic clip. Sometimes you can use that clip and you can actually stop the bleeding, but if you're not able to stop bleeding, you can at least clip the area or clip the diverticulum and kind of help identify and localize where that, ble that bleeding site is. And uh, angiography essentially uses embolization to include the vascular supply of, of where you have the bleeding. Finally, surgery. You know, surgery can be used if the bleeding doesn't stop spontaneously or if you can't stop the bleeding with colonoscopy or angiography. Ideally, you'd like to localize the bleeding some way um, in order to give your surgeon the opportunity to perform a, a segmental colectomy. For example, localize the bleeding to the sigmoid colon. They can do a segmental sig sigmoid resection. Line segmental resection is absolutely contraindicated by at least two of the guidelines that I used to um, make this talk. And then finally, if, if patient continues to have bleeding and you can't localize the bleeding and you can't fix it with angiography or colonoscopy, then subtotal colectomy can be used. It's got a high mor mortality, um, but the rebleed rate is essentially zero, which is obvious because you're taking out the entire colon. These patients generally have a high mortality rate to begin with, uh, so no surprise that subtotal colectomy has a higher mortality than some of the other uh, treatments that you can employ. Moving on, uh, ischemic colitis. So on the left side, you have a pretty pretty good picture of uh, complete necrosis of the colonic wall. On the right side, you see that area, or I should say on the right right picture, you see that area on the right side, kind of at three o'clock. There's an ulcer there. It's kind of, it's, a, it's, it's an ischemic ulcer. At 12 o'clock, you see that area that looks like it's, it's edematous, looks like um, it had undergone necrosis. Um, so I thought that was a pretty good picture there. One to 19% of all lower GI bleedings are from ischemic colitis. This results from sudden, usually temporary decrease in blood flow. Specifically, we're talking about watershed areas that are most commonly involved. Uh, classically, we talk about the splenic flexure or the rectosigmoid junction. Uh, the rectosigmoid junction accounts for 21% of all ischemic colitis. Uh, risk factors include cardiovascular disease, age, relative hypotension, less commonly hypercoagulable states, vasculitides, and different medications. Um, symptoms, this is where a good history comes into play. Sudden abdominal cramping followed by bright red blood per rectum within the next 24 hours. I really try to make patients um, pin down if they had abdominal pain prior to the bleeding. It's important, it can help, it can really dictate what we as endoscopists do or what we don't do. Um, so I think getting a good history with regard to abdominal pain prior to bleeding is very important. Uh, diagnosis, um, endoscopy classically um, will show a submucosal hemorrhage, which is an endoscopic finding probably beyond the scope of this talk. You, you can see colonic ulcerations and you'll find it in a segmental distribution. Um, the rectum is usually spared because of the blood supply. Also, which I, I should have put on this slide, diagnosis can also, um, or not maybe, if not formal diagnosis, at least assistance with diagnosing on CT imaging or, or other abdominal imaging. If you do have a watershed area specifically uh, with a good history of maybe documented hypotension and you have a watershed area where you have a segmental colitis, that can help point you towards maybe possible etiology of ischemic colitis. A treatment, the majority of the time, patients improve with supportive care. If you do um, have severe colitis or you feel like you have right-sided involvement, angiography can help uh, because there may be, in that situation, there may be concern for thrombo thromboembolism or concomitant small bowel mesenteric ischemia. So angiography may, be help, may help to um, open up an occluded vessel if you do have small bowel mesenteric ischemia, you need to call surgery because they need to evaluate the patient. This is a pretty cool chart here. So talks about the percentage of the distribution of the areas of ischemic colitis. So as you can see on the far left side, descending at 
far left side moving to the right. Descending splenic and sigmoid colon are, um, they have the highest percentage of involvement uh, as far as ischemic colitis with regard to the distribution. Moving on, another etiology, angiotasias. Far left, uh, far left top picture um, is just a, it's just kind of really, it's really zoomed in picture of an angiotasia. Far right supposedly is a picture of an of a angiotasia prior to treatment, which you see next to it where it says B. On the bottom, you just see a very, very large angiotasia or an AVM uh, in the colonic mucosa. So angiotasia definition, again, this slide here is a little bit, is, is really here for completeness sake. Um, some of the terminology uh, is, we kind of use these words interchangeably and, and they technically have different definitions. Um, some of them are more specific, some of them are non-specific. In general, especially when it comes to documentation, we use the term angiotasia. When I talk about these, these lesions, I refer to them as, as AVMs, which you see on the bottom there. Um, technically, they're not the same thing, but for, for the purposes of this talk, we'll refer to them as angiotasias. Account for three, three to 15% of lower GI bleeding. Um, the incidence of angioectasia, just the presence of them, um, increases with age. 65% of them are seen, I'm sorry, 65% are seen in patients greater than 70 years or older. The vast majority are on the right side of the colon, cecum and ascending colon, which comes into play in terms of treating them. And we'll ex explain why later on. Risk factors for bleeding angioectasias, age, uh, general comorbidities, presence of multiple angioectasias, and the use of anticoagulation or antiplatelets. Symptoms, again, painless hematochesia. These can have a real slow bleeding. So if they're, especially if they're on the right side, you can have melana, and even, even um, frequently we'll see uh, non-overt or occult bleeding, uh, and, and that, that can be from angiotasias. Diagnosis, colonoscopy is probably your, um, especially in the colon, um, endoscopy is gonna be your initial um, diagnostic tool, 80% sensitivity, and I thought this was interesting. I, I didn't. I didn't know this until I was doing research for this for this talk. We sometimes, when we do conscious sedation, we do use narcotics. Um, you know, we use fentanyl and Versed for conscious sedation. So when we use fentanyl, it actually decreases the blood flow and and it may lower the detection at the very least of actively bleeding angiotasias, if not angiotasias in general. So um, something to keep in mind because. We're all internists, no matter what we specialize in, or no matter what we do, we're all internists first. Haiti, I call it Haiti syndrome. Pa patients with history of uh, aortic stenosis can lead to type two von Willebrand disease and can lead to um, AVM formation and subsequent bleeding. Treatment for this, generally speaking, is thermal therapy. So bipolar cautery, argon plasma coagulation, we, we call it APC. Um, a lot of these times, these lesions re-bleed, you know, where you have some AVMs frequently, you know, further down or in p places where you can't get to, you will have other AVMs or, or angiotasias. And sometimes you, you know, these things pop up and they start bleeding and then they go away. And, and so sometimes it's, it's real hard to treat. And very frequently, if you, if you have AVMs in the colon um, or even in, in, the, in the upper GI tract, like the stomach or, or the duodenum, Frequently, you'll have it in the small bowel also, where standard endoscopy doesn't get to. Uh, you know, you'll need small bowel enteroscopy, which usually is at tertiary care centers and, you know, usually done by advanced endoscopy. So sometimes angiotasias, especially bleeding angiotasias, can be a real challenge to definitively treat. Um, so I thought this was a cool picture too. Top left is, is a picture of a pretty big angiotasia. That thing either has bled or is about to bleed or is actively bleeding. Uh, far right is just zoomed in. And then uh, the, the bottom two pictures, the bottom left is APC, which is about to be done. And the bottom right looks like APC is being done actively there. And, and there's, we'll show you a picture of APC later on here. This picture I got from the Mayo Clinic. This is actually from um, a review article on AVMs 
in the brain, um, but it's essentially the same anatomic variants in this small bowel and the colon and the upper GI tract. So the left side's normal, the right side is abnormal, and that's where you get kind of the leaking of, of the vessels submucosally. Moving on, hemorrhoids, everyone's favorite. So on the right side, that is a picture of the rectum. It's a retroflexed, uh, basically the colon is right inside the rectum and it's retroflexed, it's turned around, so it's kind of looking back on itself. Looks pretty angry there. Um, on the left side, obviously, uh, there's an internal and an external hemorrhoid. So definition of hemorrhoids, dilated arterial venous vessels, they come from the superior and or inferior hemorrhoidal veins, depending on where they are relative to the dentate line, we consider them internal or external. Um, they are present in up to 75% of patients with lower GI bleeding. I said that they're present. Most are incidental findings. Historically, um, hemorrhoids account for less than 10, two to 10%, really less than 10% of acute GI, lower GI bleeding. And, you know, I, I was trying to get as much information as I could, um, specifically about hemorrhoids, uh, just because we see it so much, but we don't usually think of it as an underlying cause for clinical anemia or real serious rectal bleeding. So there's been a couple of recent studies that, um, indicate that hemorrhoids may actually account for a higher percentage of lower GI bleeding as an underlying etiology than we previously thought. So something, something to think about, especially in, uh, doctors who are doing primary care, who have patients who do have um, bleeding hemorrhoids, maybe something to think about as a cause of their anemia. Symptoms, usually painless. Um, it's, it's intermittent. Usually it's scans, bright red blood per rectum. You'll see it on toilet paper. Patients will say it's, in the, it's covering the stool or it's dripping into their toilet. Um, it can be painful um, if they're thrombosed. Um, and then an uncommon symptom is itching. Diagnosis, rectal exam, which we should all be doing on patients who have bleeding, and obviously colonoscopy for internal hemorrhoids. Treatment, uh, various treatment modalities for hemorrhoids, medical management with topical anesthetics and steroids, want to keep these patients on a good bowel regimen so as they're not constipated um, to induce hemorrhoid or induce bleeding of, of present hemorrhoids. You can do uh, band ligation, sclerotherapy. That can all be done actually in the office. Generally speaking, at least in the practice of our, our attendings, um, hemorrhoid banding and sclerotherapy is done by colorectal surgery. That, that's, that's generally speaking. And I think for the most part, uh, colorectal surgeries or general surgery are the ones who really manage it. Certainly there are gastroenterologists who manage and treat uh, internal and external hemorrhoids, but in general, it's, it's, it's under the scope of colorectal surgery. Um, when to refer to colorectal surgery, you know, six to eight weeks of medical therapy that's failed or patients have symptomatic high grade hemorrhoids, or if there's acutely thrombosed hemorrhoids, which are very, very painful, those are all indications to send to colorectal surgery. If patients are greater than age 40 and you think that they only have hemorrhoids, um, they should still probably undergo colonoscopy if they haven't in the past to rule out other serious causes of bleeding like colon cancer. Generally speaking, you know, I mentioned it above, usually it's not a serious cause of rectal bleeding. By serious cause, I mean, that's probably not a good term. Uh, clinically significant with regard to anemia, hypotension, and um, you know, causing complications. Rarely, when you, you work everything else up and there's no other findings, then you can blame hemorrhoids. Cancer. Most commonly, if you have anemia from cancer, it's occult bleeding and it's not overt bleeding. Um, you know, I thought this was a really interesting um, statistic here. It accounts for about 10% of lower GI bleeding in patients age greater than 50. So everybody get your colonoscopy at age 50. Um, usually the bleeding is not necessarily from the mass itself, although it could be. It's erosion or also it's overlying erosion or ulceration of the mass. 
And that usually ends up making it hard to treat endoscopically. You know, it's really a slow, low grade, intermittent recurrent bleeding, right-sided lesions. Um, you'll have more darker, darker stools. So maroon blood or melanoma. We don't, we don't say darker or lighter. We actually use color. So maroon blood or, or melanoma. Left-sided lesions um, will have more bright red blood. You know, look for iron deficiency type anemia. Look at the MCV. Look at your iron indices. Get iron studies on your patients who have, um, who have bleeding. You know, because if this is a slow, chronic, intermittent, recurrent bleeding, they will have iron deficiency. And if they're over the age of 50, you better rule out colon cancer. So symptoms are usually asymptomatic. It's painless. It can be occult. Colonoscopy is gold standard to diagnose colorectal cancer. You can diagnose it with barium enema if you are not able to complete a colonoscopy. You have a fixed colon, tortuous colon, redundant colon. Um, you can do a barium enema, you know, and CT colonography is, um, I'd be lying if I said that we use that so far. It's not something that I've ever ordered or used, um, but it, it is a modality that is probably going to be more prevalent moving forward. Um, all of the above modalities to diagnose need some form of bowel prep. So keep that in mind. If you think you're going to get away without doing a bowel prep by ordering a barium minimum or CT colonography, you're not. And then finally, treatment for colorectal cancer, you know, for colorectal cancer, bleeding is surgery. Endoscopic therapy can be used, but we're talking about a vascular mass. It's, got, it's going to have continued ulceration. Generally speaking, we biopsy it, we come out, and it, you know, usually needs surgery if it's bleeding. Post polypectomy bleeding, that's pretty big in my world um, for non gastroenterologists and general internists and, and your residents. Uh, keep it in mind for patients who report a recent history of colonoscopy. So, it counts for two to eight percent of acute lower GI bleeding. It's usually um, delayed bleeding, you know, very, very, very frequently you'll get. Um, bleeding right when you take that polyp right when you take that polyp out, but we're talking about delayed bleeding here, which by definition means after the patient's left the endoscopy unit. Uh, 0.02 to 2 percent of patients who undergo polypectomy experience post polypectomy bleeding. Often it's five to seven days after the procedure because you know once you take that polyp out, it'll start to clot. You'll you'll get an eschar. When that eschar falls off. Um, that's when the bleeding, if it's going to happen, usually happens. And, you know, very, very frequently we'll see patients come in seven, eight days after the polypectomy with, you know, just a profuse high volume bright red blood per rectum. Some of the risk factors, you know, the bigger the polyp, the more likely uh, right-sided polypectomies are more likely to bleed. And then obviously anticoagulation status. So the sooner you start anticoagulation after a, a polypectomy, more likely you are to get bleeding. Symptoms, bright red blood per rectum, the volume and the frequency is always gonna vary depending on the patient and some of the above risk factors that I, I, I just mentioned. Diagnosis, you know, really it, it's history. You know, a patient comes in, screening colonoscopy, no prior rectal bleeding, they get six polyps out, two of them are big, a couple of them on the right side, they bleed six days after, that's gonna be your, your how you really diagnose it for the most part. Um, this often resolves spontaneously. Um, ongoing bleeding that does, does not resolve requires colonoscopy with hemostatic clip placement or thermal therapy. And you know, that's kind of out of the scope of this, of this talk. These can be a little bit challenging also because by the time you get the patient in, you wait two days, three days, they're, they're still bleeding. Sometimes it's less if it's high volume. You know, if, they're, if their hemoglobin drops, by the time you, you get them in there and you prep them, you, either you can't find the lesion or it stopped bleeding. So these, these can sometimes be tough. Some of the other etiologies of bleeding, and said use, mechanism of why that causes bleeding isn't completely understood. It's likely, or it's postulated that it's due to local mucosal trauma, local platelet inhibition can definitely make Crohn's and all sort of colitis worse. And, and said use definitely is a risk for diverticular bleeding. Radiation proctopathy, also known as radiation proctitis, 
when you have epithelial damage to the rectum, almost always after radiation therapy to the pelvic or to the lower abdomen. Um, it's, you know, it's not actually inflammation, which is why it's the real term is not radiation proc proctitis. It's neovascularization and, and formation of telangiectasias um, in, in that area. You know, and they, they don't always bleed. You can have radiation proctopathy and not have bleeding. The incidence of it is four to thirteen percent, actually. So, generally speaking, the symptoms of radiation proctopathy are diarrhea, mucus, urgency. Um, rarely is it bleeding. Treatment: short chain fatty acid enemas, caraphate enemas, certainly endoscopic therapy, um, and then ultimately surgery. Surgery really is for complicated lesions, stricturing, fistulas, things like that. Other etiologies, um, inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, infectious colitis, C. diff can definitely cause bleeding, different um, infectious um, e e etiologies, different types of E. coli can bleed. Rectal ulcers, there's a syndrome called solitary rectal ulcer syndrome. I saw that three or four months ago. It's the first time I've ever seen it. It's pretty rare. Um, Rectal varices in patients who have or are at risk for uh, either cirrhosis or portal hypertension, um, sericoral ulcer. So for us, you know, you see a, our old, you know, especially, for example, you're in the ICU, uh, ICU senior on nights, um, you know, you got your 75-year-old uh, dementia lady who rolls around with just frank bright red blood per rectum. She's constipated, you know, a lot of stool in the rectal vault. Think of a sericoral ulcer, which is ulceration from a high rectal stool burden. Um, and then uh, dulafoy lesions, these are torturous arterioles. They erode the mucosa and they bleed. They bleed a lot. They're most common in the submucosal stomach wall, but it's common. I think that's something like zero to two percent of all lower GI bleeds are from a, a dulafoy lesion. So moving on to management, um, I, again, I, I put this slide on for completeness sake. It's kind of an algorithm um, on, on what to do. We'll, we'll talk about the more practical and, and kind of how to clinically think about bleeding when, when they roll into the IC or, or when you're admitting them. Uh, I thought this was a really cool slide. I got it from a Mayo Clinic article, um, essentially a review article on, on uh, lower GI bleeding or, or hematochesia more, more specifically, kind of a five-step approach. Um, so initial, initial evaluation. So again, this stuff's going to be kind of obvious, but it's obvious because it's important. Vitals are vital. Assess the severity of the patient. Get a good history if you can. Do they have abdominal pain? Have they been bleeding for six months or did it start yesterday? What medications are they on? Did they have a polypectomy yesterday? Did they get radiation therapy for their prostate cancer 10 years ago? All that stuff is important. It will help direct your management moving forward. Physical exam, how sick is a patient? You know, sick patients need to be aggressively resuscitated. And we'll talk about that here on the next few slides. Abdominal exam is important. If they got a, you know, are they tender? Um, why do they have, a, you know, if, if their belly's tender, it's likely not diverticular. Um, don't forget to look inside their mouth, guys. So if you have a patient who comes in with bright red blood per rectum, and they're, you know, if, if they have dementia or if they're, if, if they're intubated, look into their mouth. Maybe they are having hematemesis and you're actually dealing with a brisk upper GI bleed. Um, rectal exam, for those of you who have already rotated with us, you know to do a rectal exam. Some of you know very well to do a rectal exam because you didn't do it the first couple times and a certain attending may have made sure you didn't forget. It's very, very, very important. Larry and I, almost always still do rectal exams. Uh, and Dr. Ben Shepard, who was a, the last fellow who came through this program a few years back, I remember he used to always say, lift the gown, lift the damn gown. Because if they're sitting in a puddle of, you know, melanic stool, well, you've got your answer, or at least you've got somewhere to start from. So don't be afraid to take the covers off, lift the gown and look. And do a rectal exam. Initial management, transfuse, uh, usually to at least a hemoglobin of seven. Uh, patients who have, you know, um, coronary disease or other comorbid conditions, you might want to transfuse at least to eight, if not nine. Uh, 
vitamin K um, for patients who have coagulopathy or have or who have an elevated INR because they're on warfarin. And I put question mark next to the FFP because especially in patients who have coagulopathy from um, liver disease, we're finding less than we're finding more and more that fresh frozen plasma works less and less. In fact, it may not really work at all. And there's a recent uh, publication right before COVID kind of came, came about a few months prior that essentially eliminated FFP as a good way to lower the INR, really lower than two, two and a half, um, especially on patients who have liver disease. It essentially doesn't work. Now, if their INR is eight or nine, certainly FFP is going to be better than nothing. Vitamin K takes a few days to work. I gave somebody IV vitamin K a couple months ago and they had anaphylaxis, which I was taught not to do during residency. I did it anyways in fellowship. And so, you know, with vitamin K, be careful. Oral vitamin K takes a couple days to work. Sub-Q vitamin K takes less than a couple days, but certainly those are all slower than IV vitamin K. You know, ideally we like the INR as low as possible. Most of the, it's not even guidelines, but just most of the literature talks about an INR of less than 2.5. Someone's actively bleeding, you aggressively resuscitate them, including fixing their INR. Ideally less than 2.5. In practice, it's less than 1.7 or really less than two, depending on what you're doing. If they're actively bleeding, you've got to do what you've got to do. Um, but 2.5 is kind of the magic number that a lot of the, at least the recommendations, if not the guidelines talk about. Platelets greater than 50,000. If you're given more than three units of packed RBCs in one hour, you are massively transfusing and you need to co-administer platelets and plasma in one to one to one ratio. There is a massive transfusion protocol at OSU. I'd never ordered it. I've, I'd never done it. I hadn't even really seen it more than once or twice. I've seen it a lot here at St. Francis. Um, usually the trauma service, or in your guys' case, the surgery service may be involved, um, but essentially it's giving um, blood products in a one-to-one-to-one -one -one ratio. There's a clear mortality benefit and a clear improvement in hemostasis, especially pre-endoscopically. Resuscitation first and second and third. So resuscitation is going to be key, guys. There are multiple studies. There's a mountain of evidence that shows you have mortality benefit with aggressive resuscitation prior to endoscopy and re aggressive resuscitation attempts even. So that may mean blood products, colloid, crystalloid, reverse to coagulopathy. If they're bleeding and bleeding and they're unstable, you know, if it's within the first six, eight, 10, 12 hours, do what you have to do. Put a big bore IV in, give them 15 units of blood, put them on two pressors. If you attempt aggressive resuscitation and you can't get them stable, then that's an indication to do an unstable endoscopy. We will do it. We have to do it. Um, but if they're, not, if they're not resuscitated and they can be, and we do endoscopically before they're resuscitated or we do endoscopy, they have a higher mortality rate. So I want to hammer that point home here, okay? Um, and let's not forget, patients who have a unstable, what appears to be right red blood parectum, we have to consider endoscopy, upper endoscopy first to rule out a brisk upper GI bleed, especially because they don't need to be prepped for an upper endoscopy. Um, if they have an NG tube, you can attempt a gastric lavage to assess for blood versus bile. You can drop an NG tube and you can assess for um, uh, blood with, with a gastric lavage with, you know, with some just normal saline. Um, if you get blood from the, from the lavage, then you, know, you likely have an upper GI bleed. If you don't get blood, then that does not rule out an upper GI bleed, okay? Um, you can put in, you can, yes, you can put an NG tube in um, if patient is suspected to have varices. Um, the contraindication to an NG tube is when patients recently have had banded varices. So keep that in mind. And then I always call this a poor man's you know, upper GI bleed test, BUN to creatinine ratio of greater than 30. So I always look at that. It at least gives you some more information. You can't bank on it, but it usually is not wrong. Um, you know, if, if you are concerned that you're having a severe uh, 
uh, hematochesia with hemodynamic instability, or emergent EGD is gonna be your test of choice. And again, don't forget to resuscitate. Localization of bleeding. Um, patients who are stable should undergo a colonoscopy first, followed by EGD if the colonoscopy is negative. Colonoscopy has at least a 50% diagnostic yield, if not anywhere from 50 to 100%. It's got a higher diagnostic yield than angiography or tagged RBC skin. So technetium 99 uh, labeled RBC scintigraphy, also known as tagged RBC scan, bleeding scan. It can detect actively, active bleeding at a rate of 0.1 mLs per minute. Uh, angiography done by interventional radiology can de detect bleeding if it's greater than 0.5 mLs per minute. Um, it's actually not as much as you'd think, actually. They have to be bleeding pretty fast for uh, an angiography by IR to demonstrate bleeding. Um, finally, colonoscopy. The left picture is goofy because um, that fellow is holding the scope with the wrong hand. So I thought that was funny. And the right side, the picture on the right, I don't know. It just looks like a cartoon. It's just a funny picture. So uh, finally, let's talk about some of the endoscopic management uh, via colonoscopy. So thermal therapy, talked about this a little bit earlier. Heater probe, bipolar, bipolar coagulation or heater probe. You're actually putting a probe. Um, it's got a metal at the end of it. You are touching the mucosa. You are causing burning of the mucosa. You have to have platelets, you have to have some ability to coagulate because um, you're, you're gonna be burning that tissue. So it, it's touching the tissue. That, you know, that in theory can have a risk of perforation. It can, in theory, cause more bleeding. Um, and then thermal therapy also includes uh, argon plasma, which is really, really cool. You emit this argon gas, it gets ionized, um, by this high voltage that you push out. Now you have a stomach with this argon gas, and now it conducts your electric current. If you look on the left, you're actually not even touching the mucosa, so there's no physical contact. Why am I even talking about this? Because it's, it's good for thin-walled mucosa, like the right side of the colon, you know, potentially parts of the small bowel or parts of the duodenum, even parts of the stomach. Um, you can really use this to get angiotages pretty good. Um, so uh, that's, that's thermal therapy. You can use mechanical therapy, and that refers to a clip. So either an endo clip or a hemostatic clip. It's fast. It's relatively easy to place. I wrote operator dependent because it's not that easy for me to place quite yet. Um, and sometimes, depending on where the anatomy or where the lesion is anatomically, it may preclude your ability to get that clip all the way across the lesion. It's safe, not a lot of complications. And, you know, it it's, can be used for marking also. If, if you can't actually stop bleeding or get hemostasis, but you see a, a bleeding diverticulum, you can try to get the clip in there and at the very least mark it so that when your interventional radiologist goes in there, he can, he has a, you know, he kind of has a roadmap. He sees where the clip is. He can get to it, right-sided colon, left-sided colon, distal, proximal. So if for nothing else, if you can find a lesion that's bleeding, you can try to clip it. And if you can't get it to stop, you can at least mark it. Um, then epinephrine. So um, it's usually in a 1 to 10,000 uh, epinephrine to saline ratio. You get near immediate vasoconstriction of all the small uh, vasculature near the lesion. Um, it is really epinephrine is used to improve visualization in real time with active bleeding. So you've got a, you know, you, you've found your ulcer, it's actively oozing, you're washing it off, it keeps on oozing, and you can't see the vessel anymore, or, or you can't see the, the degree of the actual lesion. You inject some epinephrine around the lesion, wait a, you know, wait a minute or two, it usually stops the bleeding right away. It's, a, it's not a permanent fix. Um, so you use it to stop bleeding and then you will always combine it with either thermal therapy or mechanical therapy. Very specific guidelines, you do not use epinephrine um, as monotherapy. It always has to be used in combination, if you're able to use it in combination. And then, you know, further endoscopy, if colonoscopy is negative, then you, you do go to 
an EGD. If your EGD is negative, you can try to do a capsule endoscopy. That's usually going to evaluate the small bowel. Um, and then if you always remember, if you're going to do a capsule endoscopy, remember, if it's positive, capsule is not, you can't do therapy with it. So what's your next step? Can you, can you do small bowel enteroscopy? Does your, um, you know, does your institution do it? Can you transfer them? Are they stable for transfer? So I think when we use capsule endoscopy, we've got to really think about kind of the, 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 next, the, the next level or, you know, kind of higher order, like, like what's next with a positive result there. The non-endoscopic management, you know, we're talking about really interventional radiology here and surgery. So mesenteric angiography, you know, with or without nuclear RBC scan, uh, you'd, you'd like to have localization prior to them going in. Uh, it's, it's usually reserved for patients either with such severe bleeding that you can't stabilize them or you, you can't prep them, or if you can localize the bleeding endoscopically, but you can't actually achieve hemostasis. So generally speaking, I put this in all caps, we do not do unprepped colonoscopies. Of course, I just, you know, that's true. We did an unprepped colonoscopy a week ago and we found a lesion. So. Um, but in general, unprepped colonoscopies are not a thing. High risk of complication, very low yield, can't see anything, can't find the lesion, got stool everywhere. Um, so in general, if, if you can't do a prep, then you can use interventional radiology. Um, angiography, like we said before, it's got to be bleeding at a rate of 0 0.5 mLs per minute. Uh, colonoscopy is better if you're able to achieve hemostasis. There's a lower risk of rebleeding, um, and then mesenteric angiography carries about 15 to 20 percent uh, risk of adverse events. You get bowel infarction depending on how big of a section you embolize or they they embolize. You know you got to watch out for renal failure because you're giving them contrast and you can get hematomas. Finally, surgery rarely required. Um, it's really reserved as kind of a last resort for persistent or refractory. Um, bleeding it's really the best for diverticular bleeding again um, not all the time but most of the time it's used for diverticular bleeding and you know when you talking about surgery it's when patients are hypotensive or in hemorrhagic shock despite you know trying aggressive resuscitation if you know if you've transfused six or more units call your surgeon if they're still bleeding you know if you've done a pan and just you know pan intestinal evaluation and they're still bleeding call your surgeon um, and then always remember if you're calling a surgeon for acute and persistent bleeding these patients have a high mortality rate surgery itself for this indication has a high mortality rate also so just keep that in mind all right almost done take home points uh, diverticular bleeding is the most common cause of lower GI bleeding remember it's painless bleeding remember to ask for a history of known diverticulosis. It's a goofy word. Patients will usually remember the word diverticulosis. Not to be confused with diverticulitis, obviously. Um, take a good history and physical. I know it's obvious, um, but it's key. If it wasn't key, I wouldn't keep on saying it. So it's important to help guide pre-endoscopic diagnosis. Not necessarily to choose if we're gonna do an EGD or a colonoscopy, but to help kind of guide what we're looking for, okay? Um, Pre-procedure management will and can dictate the outcome. You guys are on the front lines, especially um, you know if you're if you're a hospitalist or if you're in the ICU. You guys are the front line. You guys are kind of in the trenches before we get there. Before we call the endoscopy team, that takes 20, 30, 40 minutes. So um, you you guys can potentially dictate the outcome. Resuscitate, resuscitate, resuscitate. I'm not going to beat that dead horse. Um, you know, if, if you have a brisk, if you have hemodynamic instability with bright red blood per rectum, consider a brisk upper GI bleed. Transfuse to seven uh, on the hemoglobin, platelets to 50, INR of 2.5. Um, if you can't perform an, an endoscopy because they're unstable, localization is going to be important to help our radiology colleagues. So tagged RBC scan can help for sure. If at any time you guys are unsure or you just have questions or you want to run a case by us, or you know you want to review a case um, after the fact, call us. We're always here to help. Uh, and then don't forget to perform rectal exam when you guys rotate with us. We'll re remind you, and so will Dr. Raman. Uh, here's are my references. 
And then if you guys have any questions, feel free to call, text, email. If don't feel like you're a burden, if I can't answer, don't worry, I just won't. Uh, we really, really, really enjoy having you guys rotate with us. We are really, really working to make the fellowship, especially for the residents who are rotating with us, a really an academic um, teaching service. We want you guys to be involved. You guys, we run the service. So, um, you know, Larry and I and, and Bob and Trace who are, who are joining next year, we run the service. We are, we are doing everything. So you guys are running it with us. We rely on you guys a lot. So it's a fun month. Come prepared. Come with gloves. Make sure to ask for lube. Do rectal exams. Um, and again, if you have any questions, by all means, call me, call Larry. We're always happy to help. With that said, hope you guys have a good night or a good day, depending on when you're listening to this. And talk to you guys later.